My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. And today is November the 24th, 2023. We're here in, what city is this? This is not a city, this is the county of Fremont okay. in Colorado. Uh -huh. And uh, what is your name? My name is uh, Michael White, and they call me Mike. Mm -hmm. And how old are you? I'm 71 years old. When's your birthday? Uh, October the 13th, 1952. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in Dallas, Texas. Where were you living at the time? What branch of the service did you go into? I went into the U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose that branch? I chose the Air Force because I was interested in becoming an air traffic controller. Mm -hmm. And I went in to talk to them about the possibility of joining and going into and learning air traffic control. Uh, where were you living at the time you went into service? I was living in Richardson, Texas. Uh -huh which is a suburb of Dallas. Okay. Where was basic training? Uh, basic training was in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. at, how, how long was it? Go ahead. At Lackland Air Force Base. Got it. How long was basic? Basic was six weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, where'd you go to, uh, where was tech school? Tech school w was in, uh, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. And how long was that? Oh, let's see. Uh, I got there, I probably started tech school in July of 1974, and I graduated in January of 1975, so that's about six months or so. Okay. So you became an air, air traffic controller? No, I did not. Uh, I was going to have to wait an, a year and a half to be to get into air traffic control. So the recruiter suggested I take all the tests and see what my aptitude was because I was going to have to take those anyway. Right. And so when he got my results back, he called me up and he said, "Let's go to lunch." <laughs> that was his. That's what I remember him saying. He <laughs> took me out to lunch, uh -huh. and when I got out there, I found out I scored uh, the top in everything except admin, admin, uh -huh. administrative stuff, which I wasn't interested in anyway. Right. <laughs> so uh, his suggestion was I go in as an E90, uh, that E is electronics, right. electronics 90, uh -huh. and... Uh, so I told him that, uh, you know, I'd think about it, mm -hmm. and to be honest with you, uh, I like electronics a lot. My, uh, I, I knew I had an aptitude for electrical stuff because I did a lot of that kind of on my own when I was in high school and right. after high school. So, And I was also good at working on cars and other things, so I knew I had a mechanical aptitude yeah. also. So uh, I decided, after thinking about it a little bit, uh, to go into electronics because I knew that when I got out, I would uh, I would be able to get a job in electronics as some sort of technician. Right. Because I didn't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. Another reason I was going in was uh, I had gone to college, and it's not that I couldn't graduate from college it just wasn't you know I wasn't in the right frame of mind to put my nose to the grindstone in high school I was able to get through high school without doing a lot of book work when I I went to North Texas State in Denton which is north of Dallas and I tried to do the same thing <laughs> and they suspended me academically because I never really cracked a book and you can't graduate, I mean, those guys 
you go to a, a lecture and that's not what's in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have their standard rote tests that they make out of the books, and right. if you don't read the book, you don't know anything, and that's basically uh, my my downfall. What you ran into? Yeah. Uh -huh. So what'd you do? Well, so then I got out, and I I don't know. I had a job at a printing company. You got? What do you mean you got out? You got I, out when? I, I got out. Well, I got out. I I was out of college. And I was just working around driving forklift, working in a shipping thing, and that's what made me think, yeah, I need to find a career. And so I thought uh, I like to travel, so I thought the Air Force, mm -hmm. and I thought the, you know, the, obviously the air traffic control. But then I got into the electronics and went in there, and I did well in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, ended up getting uh, stationed at. Uh, uh, in Abilene at Dias Air Force Base mm -hmm. and uh, in Texas in Texas how long was the tour uh, well I, they didn't really give you a length they just said uh, you go in well how long were you there uh, I was there a year and a half okay and I was in SAC I worked on B-52s mm -hmm. uh, I worked on I uh, my iOS was Doppler radar okay and so i worked on doppler radar on b-52s kc-135 c-130 c-141s uh and i was eligible for to uh, repair inertial nav systems on f-4s mm -hmm. which i eventually did that too so uh i i was there and i and i got orders to okinawa mm. And in Okinawa is where I worked on the F-4 equipment. Okay, how long were you in Okinawa? I was in Okinawa for 18 months. What year was that? I uh, went into Okinawa, I see, uh, let's see, I got out in 78. So 18 months, that would be uh, 76, I guess I went to okay. Okinawa. So um, tell, tell us about the duty. Uh, which one, uh, the, uh, the Dias or all of them or? Well, okay, so Dias was in what state? That was in Texas, that okay. was in Abilene, Texas. So how long were you there? That's where I was, that was my first tour of duty for 18 months. Mm -hmm. I worked on B-52s and I had an opportunity. They also, they had B-52s there, SAC outfit. I was in the 96 bomb wing. And then they also had the 463rd Mac unit, which was C-130s. And there was an, a, a program that came up where you could swap with, a, uh, with another airman and another uh, working on, you know, different airplanes in, a, in another uh, outfit. Right. On, and on the same base... And that's what I did. There was a guy who got married, and he, and the Mac guy, the Mac outfit, was going TDY for two months at a time over to Germany, to England, and Panama. And in, in the uh, SAC outfit, you just worked on airplanes and launched them and recovered them and fixed them, and that's that was your life. And I thought, you know, boy, I'd love to do that. <laughs> and I went over to Germany, uh -huh. I got over there, and I went over to Germany, and my uh, commander, the, the AMS, Avionics Maintenance Squadron commander, didn't really want me to go because, uh, not bragging or anything, I was pretty good at my Yeah, job. you're doing your job, you didn't want to lose that skill. He didn't yeah, want skill. to lose me, right. and I was on like the Red Ball Express, and <laughs> I was really good at fixing an air, fixing a problem quickly mm -hmm. on an airplane that was about to take off and to have to pull an airplane out that was bad so it was best to be able to for it to take off and I was good at that and he didn't want to lose that mm -hmm. and so uh, I always kind of considered him as a maybe one of the reasons that I ended up in Okinawa <laughs> because he used to be the com the commander in the CBPO, which uh -huh. was the Consolidated Base Personnel Office, so he 
you know, knew the ins and outs of that. So I, he had the guy that come over, came over and replaced me, put in a thing said he wouldn't, he didn't want a, a transfer. And when I went over to the Mac outfit, they didn't do that. So that I, my, I was open. Now I enjoyed Okinawa. Don't get me wrong. Mm. And uh, I did just as good over there repairing uh, inertial nav equipment for F4s right. as I did at the other place. So my uh, enjoyment of doing the job in the Air Force was high. Mm -hmm. And I might have made Air Force a career. That wasn't my initial goal. My initial goal was to get in, get a career training mm -hmm. and then get a civilian job when I got out. That was my goal. And I will have to mention a pivotal uh, point when I decided to get out and I started making preparations for it and it was when I was in SAC mm -hmm. and it was the same commander that I might have had something to do with me going to Okinawa. Might not have. I don't know. But I never was very, I never was, a, a, you know, a military, I didn't have a military mind. And I didn't really enjoy the regimentation of the whole thing. And I never was very good at, you know, keeping my uniform, like, really good. I mean, it might be a little wrinkled. I might... <laughs> iron it up a little bit, you know, uh -huh. and I ended up in the commander's office uh, with him saying, look, I'm going to challenge you to look a lot better when you stand inspection. Right. So I told him I would. And uh, I'm a man of my word. If I tell someone I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Right. And I did it. And he had rewarded me with... <laughs> I don't know if it was a reward or not. It was kind of fun. With a going on a refilling mission, B-52 refilling mission. So I'm riding on a KC-135 mm -hmm. for, I don't know, 12 hours sitting there. We played cards the whole time. And so, like, that whole thing, maybe 30, 30 minutes to an hour, mm -hmm. uh, we refilled one B-52. Mm -hmm. So I spent that whole time, and I got to be next to the guy refilling and that was a lot of fun. He looking at the plane and refilling it was that was pretty cool. Okay. But we're playing cards. But the key thing about that was the officers that were sitting there, it was on there playing cards with, went to North Texas State where I had gone to school and flunked out. Right. And they were officers. I was enlisted. Mm -hmm. They made it through. I didn't make it through. I think you get the drift. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. And I and so I'm thinking, I'm as intelligent as these guys. Right. I can get a degree. Right. And right then and there, I said, man, when I get back, I'm going to, to the credit union and get a savings account to the CBPO and get some and make an allotment going to the savings account mm -hmm. so that when I get out of the Air Force after one tour, yeah. I'm going to have some money to buy myself a vehicle again, you know, and have some money to be in the bank. Because a lot of times, you know, you don't make much money in the Air Force, so nobody had any money in the bank. So, you know, they, they don't know how they're going to make a living so they usually realize so that that was my decision point to say okay I'm not gonna realize I'm gonna have money in the bank when I get out when my tour was up in Okinawa I got out uh, at uh, in, in the Oakland area at uh, God, Travis Air Force Base right. that was it and uh, and I and I got into school and I got a college degree because I was uh, a Vietnam era vet and right. I had great benefits. And uh, I went to school. I got my degree. I met my wife, and uh, I ended up getting a software engineering degree. My plan was to get a 
electrical engineering degree, but I couldn't get into electrical engineering school because of what I had done at, in Denton at, at North Texas. And my brother, me going back to school, he wanted to go get his degree in forestry and he wanted to go to Stephen F. Austin. So I said, okay, I'll go there. I got the money and I'll make up the classes to get into electrical engineering school. And I had to come up with a, a degree plan. And so I thought, well, they had a software engineering degree plan, a, a bachelor's of science. So I said, okay, I'm sure that's going to be needed for electrical engineering. I got into it and I said, heck, man, why do I need to go electrical engineering? This is a great career and I'm good at it. And, uh, and so that's what I did. I went into that and uh, I was very successful there too. I, so that's in civilian life, right? That's in civilian life. So who'd you work for after the military? Well, uh, first I went to work for Vought Corporation, uh -huh. which does military contracts. They actually built the, the uh, A-8 aircraft for the Navy. And uh, I went there and uh, worked in the database area on mainframe computers. And then from there, uh, I went. I worked for a couple of uh, software development companies, and I developed software. And uh, while I was doing that, uh, kind of a little thing early on in life, I had come out here to Colorado, and I really liked it. And I had a goal: mm -hmm. go to Colorado. Matter of fact, when I met my wife. I told her, I said, five years, I'd like to be in Colorado, and she liked it too. And so we had a plan, five years. It took 12, <laughs> but so, and the way I got out here is I got a job with Storage Tech in Louisville. And I worked, I worked there for 23 years. Mm. So I had a very good career there. I had patents. I just a really good, developed some unique software and I use my electronic knowledge because I also develop firmware and firmware is about connecting to hardware taking software tell hardware what to do or getting indicators you know getting status or whatever or controlling how the I worked on disk drives and tape drives so my soft my firmware controlled the operation of reading and writing the tape or the disc on these big disc and tape drives that connected to mainframes. So I started out with mainframes, learned all about them, used that when I got to storage tech to be able to work to develop firmware for the hardware to talk to the mainframe. So I was able to tie all that together, it all worked out, I had a great career, I've been retired now for eight years. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, the entire time that you were on active duty, did you ever have a problem staying in touch with your family? No. no? Okay, good. Hey, how was, the, how was the food through the service anyway? Well, in the Air Force, it was pretty good. I mean, uh, you know, we had a, compared to, you know, some of the services, I know uh, when I was in Okinawa, I interfaced with a lot of Marines. Mm -hmm. And those guys loved to come to the Air Force Base <laughs> and eat because... You know, I'd sit there and talk to them, and they go, you know, all we get is, is a big pan full of Kool-Aid to drink, and you guys actually got soda fountains, you know. So there was, we had uh, chow hall, you know, we had uh, midnight chow, you know, we go, and they'd cook eggs to, to order. So I can't complain about the food because... Uh, Did you have all the supplies good. that you needed through the military? Yeah, I never had a problem. You didn't have a problem? Okay. Yeah. Good. And were you ever in combat? I was never in combat. What, what, okay, so I know you got some medals. What did you get medals for? Oh, I got some medals mainly for uh, time and service type thing, being in the service, being in an outfit, you know, that, that had some medals, you know, because you kind of inherit those when you're in there a little bit. 
and uh, I never really did anything, you know, where I went out and something outstanding and they awarded a medal for me. Yeah, but you kept those planes going though, didn't you? I did keep the planes going. Yeah, tell me two of your most memorable experiences during your active duty time. You know, you kept those planes going, so you. Well, I, so in that in that event, you you kept people living. Keep I going. did. Yeah, so uh, you know, uh, we we had a lot. Mine was a peacetime thing. So, okay. So we did things like they would have alerts. And we'd have to come, and and they'd, all the planes would take off, and when they would return, we'd have to turn them, so they were ready to, and they'd have to take off again. Mm -hmm. So that was that was our goal and those things. So you know, just every once in a while, there's a there's a hard uh, piece of equipment to to fix, or mm -hmm. you have to solve a problem to get a plane off. Those right. are my memorable. Uh, riding on the launch truck, that would be a memorable experience. What is that? What does that mean? The launch truck is is uh, the Red Ball Express thing, and the planes are taken off, and they're all lined up on the, on the hammerhead there, and if one of them had a, had a problem, you had, to, you had to go in there and figure it out. What's a hammerhead? Uh, that's the that's the area where it's ready to take off. So it's sitting there revving up, and uh, put the hammer down. <laughs> okay. And the plane takes off, mm -hmm. and uh, those planes were very noisy. I guess, <laughs> I guess you know you when you say memorable experience, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, what's a great thing you did? To be honest with you, uh, probably my most memorable experience. Mm -hmm was not necessarily what one would call a good experience. I was riding on the launch truck and we had this piece of equipment called an IFF. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a required piece of equipment because that is secure communications from the airplane to the controllers, you know, the Air Force, whoever was controlling the mission and stuff. And so we had to cannibalize one out of a hangar. Right. And we had a we had a master sergeant. He had just come back from Utapau in Thailand. Mm -hmm. That's a combat. Uh, that's where they launched planes that flew over uh, Vietnam. Okay. And so he was a kind of an excitable guy. He's driving the launch truck, and we had a uh, nuclear, you know, uh, nuke, planes loaded with nuclear bombs and mm -hmm. ready to launch at any moment. And there was a, a, a pathway in between those two areas, and there was a red line around me. You could not cross that red line. Mm -hmm. And this guy cut the corner. <laughs> and so we had, so as soon as he got to the other side of that thing to where he was out of the launch area we told him to stop because the SPs were already coming. We could already, there was a bunch of trucks coming at us. Mm -hmm. And so we said stop and we went over and grabbed him, you know, like we were holding him prisoner. And we said, we got him, we got him. And they go, no. Everybody out of the truck on the ground. I said, January. It's cold. And we're on the ground with M16s pointing at our head. They put us two by two in those pickup trucks with M16s pointing at our head. Took us to an empty hangar, took us out, took everything off us. Well, they didn't take our clothes, but you know. Mm -hmm. And lined us up against the wall with M16s pointing at us. And the commander comes in there and he's red hot because now this guy mm -hmm. has got all these airplanes sitting out on the runway burning fuel and nobody to do anything with them because mm -hmm. we're all under arrest in the hangar. And so yeah, that was memorable. <laughs> that was very memorable. <laughs> How did it turn out? Well, they got the airplanes off late. I don't remember if we got that IFF part on there or not, to be honest with you. Okay. Cause you know, that's almost 50 years ago, but, mm -hmm. 
you know, we got past it, and it wasn't long after that I ended, that's when I got to, uh, into the Mac outfit, and as soon as I got there, they sent me off to Germany, uh -huh. and uh, that was pretty good. I, so there was a memorable flight coming back from Germany, because we had an air, uh, problems with the airplane, they, they, the gauges for the fuel gauges. Uh -huh. So we had to land in Mildenhall, England, and <laughs> we're landing, and I'm, and we're on this bus, they're taking us to the, I don't know, to some building out on the, on the uh, flight line, you know, where yeah. we're gonna wait for them to figure out what's wrong with the plane. And I was sitting right behind the driver, <laughs> and we're in England. And so they're driving on the wrong side of the road. And I, uh, you know, I was really tired because it's like three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd been sleeping. They woke us up and all this other stuff. And uh, so I yelled at him, you're on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and? He was cool about it. <laughs> and as soon as I realized my mistake, I uh, told him I was sorry. Okay. <laughs> You got through that, right? I got through that, right. and so that was kind of weird. <laughs> okay. Um, besides the places the places you've already mentioned, where else did you travel? Really, throughout your life? Throughout my life? Yeah. Where Where, where have you been? Oh my God, a lot of places. For one thing. Uh, my wife and I have ridden our motorcycles in every state in the Union. Okay. In, including Hawaii. Now, we didn't take our motorcycles over there. We rented them over there. Okay. But I've been there. I've been to Hawaii. Uh, I've been to Mexico, Cabo. We had a, a, a timeshare there for 10 years. I've mm -hmm. uh, been over to uh, Europe. Obviously, I went to Germany in the Air Force, but I've been there on my own when I was, uh, you know, it was a business trip right. uh, with Storage Tech. Uh, I've been to England. I've been to Italy three times, four times. Uh, been to Denmark, which uh, is a is an ancestral home. Uh, I'm. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side was from Denmark, okay. so I'm pretty. I got a lot of Danish in there, and uh, so yeah, I've been to a lot of a lot of different places. Okay, I like traveling. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Uh, well, yeah, obviously it did. I. You know, I, it, to be honest with you, when I went in to the military, I, I sort of waited until after the Vietnam War was over because I was kind of against it. And uh, it, I didn't even realize I was a Vietnam veteran until I retired from storage tech because they showed me my, you know, my military record and it said on there I was a Vietnam veteran. Right. And I'm going well, during that era. I was in during the era, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I learned a lot, actually, I learned a lot, and it did a lot of good for me because, you know, I really wasn't that uh, into taking care of myself and stuff, so I had to learn how to do that because when you're in the military, you got to take care of yourself. People right. aren't going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Nobody is. So you got to learn how to do it for yourself, so I learned that. And, you know, I learned about a lot about being in the military. After I got out, I didn't really think much about having been in the military. I just did the things I knew and had learned. I knew I liked the travel that I did. And, you know, I didn't mention, you know, I was, obviously I was in Okinawa and I went to Korea on, a, on leave and I went over to the Philippines on leave just to see those areas. But, uh, so I did a lot of that. And... So, I wasn't really a, of a military mind. I wasn't regimented like that. So, I, I learned some regimentation as much as I wanted to get involved with. Right. Uh, I've always been kind of a, 
a self-thinker. My dad was that way, and so I grew up. And so I wasn't really a, of a military mind. I wasn't regimented like that. So I, I learned some regimentation as much as I wanted to get involved with. Right. Uh, I've always been kind of a, a self-thinker. My dad was that way, and so I grew up kind of thinking that way. So I was always pretty good at doing that, and he was always good at being able to figure stuff out and how to go places to get the information to do that. So I used that a lot, so I did that, and I still do that today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got all that from my dad, though. Uh, but, you know, from the military, I just... I just learned about working with the government, I guess, you uh -huh. know, because there's an aspect. When you're dealing with the government, you have to understand how they think, and the military um, taught me how to do that, how to understand how the government thinks about doing things, paying you, doing this, you know, rules, doing what you say you're going to do, you know. If they... you. If they want you to do something, they expect you to do it, mm -hmm. you know. Or, or in civilian life, if you don't do it, a lot of people get away with not doing what is expected of them. That isn't the way it is. They'll give you an Article 15 in a heartbeat or something <laughs> else, you know. So you pretty well got to do it. So I learned all those things. Last question. Yeah, okay. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well... You know, today I'm, I'm in the American Legion. It's not anything I ever thought about before I went in or even after I went in. I didn't join the American Legion until I retired and learned that I was a Vietnam veteran and they were sending me these things, you know, join, and I just kind of ignored them. But when I came here, I didn't know anybody. So I thought, man, that's a good way to meet some people that have done things that I've done, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a good move. And, uh, and not only do I work with the American Legion, I work with other veteran organizations. Okay. So I was not, you know, what I would call an advo uh, advocate for veterans or working with veterans or anything like that until I came here. Mm -hmm. And got exposed to the American Legion in, in working with veterans, their families, kids, and, and that stuff. And I had the time to do it. So uh, that turned out to be good. That was a good thing. Okay. Anything else that you'd like to share you feel like you have not? Uh, well, you know, even though I never felt like I... I had a kindred spirit with the veterans. Uh, actually, it turned out I do. And one of the things when I got into the Legion that, that bothered me was the fact that I was never in combat. And because most of them were in combat somewhere in Korea. Uh, we have, I have one World War II veteran uh -huh who still rides a motorcycle, and he is my sergeant-at-arms. He's 94 years old. Think about that. Mm -hmm. And he's still riding a motorcycle, too. It's a trike, but it's still a motorcycle. Right. And so all of these various things, but really the, the thing that I really had to get over when I joined the Legion was the fact that I had not been in combat now, there's others that hadn't been, but 90% of these guys were over in Vietnam tramping right. around in the bush. Uh -huh. And, you know, so they have, they have experiences and stories that I never experienced, even though I've known a lot of people that have been over there, and good friends, too. Uh -huh. And so uh, I understand, and, and I work with building motorcycles for veterans who've been over, most of them over in Iraq, but... It, you know, uh, you know, over in in the in the current wars, 
that you know, lost limbs, whatever, can't ride, and we get these motorcycles and we fix them up so that they can ride them. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'm very involved with. Okay. And so, yeah. Um, just so you know, this, this project is about um, all of us that have served, whether it was in peacetime or not, but we served honorably, which you have. Uh huh. Okay. Um, the only consolation I have for you for that, not that you even asked me for that, mm -hmm. however, um, we all signed that, that contract that we give our lives to the country if we had to. So um, I never forget that. Both my parents served, um, uncles, my son, my nephew, and I served too. So um, it's a calling. We all just don't get called to uh, have to give our lives. That's right. Okay, but um, like I said, you know, people have walked away from it. I saw people that walked away from it, but then I also saw those of us that stayed. Yeah. That's my, um, I'm glad I never had to shoot anybody or had anybody shoot back at me. Yeah. But if I had to, I would have. I'm sure I would have too. Exactly. And a lot of people have a lot of memories mm -hmm. that haunt them because of that. Right. You know, you, you talk about, I have a friend uh, that I went to college with that I met, he was a Marine, and, and he shot a young girl in Vietnam mm -hmm. that has haunted him because he didn't know if he really, over there, I'm sure you know it, I don't know if you were in Vietnam, well, uh -huh. if you went in in 78, you were. Uh -huh. but, you know, you couldn't tell who was who right. over there, but it didn't it didn't matter. He still knew he shot a young girl, right. and it still bothered. And he went back to Vietnam to that spot. Mm -hmm. He did go back, and uh, so a lot of people. Well, I want to thank you that. for your service. Okay. Well, I also want to thank you for thank this interview. You. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for your service. Absolutely. Yes.